Yeah, life is going to happen to you. But what I found out and figured out is this. Write this down. Life is 10% what happens to you. This You got to get this. But it's 90% how you choose to respond to it. The Bible tells us, choose this day who you'll serve. Every day. So we just chose hope, faith, opportunity instead of blame, doubt, fear. That's the secret sauce right there. That's the formula. This right here is the foundation of success. People want that success too quickly, but you don't have a foundation, so it's not sustainable and it crumbles. Oh, come on, somebody. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Inspire with Carrie. Um, I'm your host, Carrington Austin. I'm so excited about our guest today, Mr. Ken Brown. He is an entrepreneur, an author, um, a business coach, and, and an inspirational speaker. And um, he's actually owned and operated uh, several McDonald's uh, franchises, and he has such an amazing story. And I think you guys will be so inspired by him, especially, um, tune in, especially if you are wanting to start a business or even more specifically, if you want to get into um, franchising or um, tune in if ever you feel like, gosh, I feel like I have all these obstacles that are against me. I feel like so-and-so has this and so-and-so grew up with that and I didn't grow up with that. I, I think you'll be so inspired by Mr. Um, Mr. Ken Brown's story. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to kind of get started. Um, my first question for you, I know that um, we can start from the beginning. I know that you were uh, born to teen parents. And if I'm not mistaken, were you two in the line of how many kids? Yeah, you got it. Um, actually, my mother my mother was 13. My father was 14. And by the age of 20, they had five children under eight. Um, and yeah, I am number two. I am the, sec the second. Um, born and raised in Chicago. But you know, it's so interesting. But, um, you know, the Bible tells us not to, not, to decide small, not to despise small beginnings. That's right. And I think it's important for... Um, for every entrepreneur, anyone who want to live their dream, maximize their life, is that, you know, you know, without any struggle, there's no progress. And so I look back at my life and I've, I've been able to travel the world from Africa to Alabama. And it's so interesting that being born to teenage parents and I'll go on to say I was evicted 10 times growing up, that those adversities, um, if I had a chance do my life over again, I wouldn't change any one of those because it made me an adversity expert. It gave me perseverance. It gave me creative creativity. I can go any, you No, know, most people, if something happened to them, oh, I'm, I got to kill myself. I don't know what yeah. I'm going to do. Yeah. You know what? I wake up in a day. I wake up every day. Guess what I do? I look for opportunities so I can stretch and grow. Woo. Come on, somebody. That's powerful. I love that. So yeah, so born to teenage parents, Vicky Ten Times growing up in the, in the, uh, in Chicago. It's, it's so interesting. Um, that my mother, and while I gotta say this, I gotta give honors to them because people said, wow, they were 13 and 14. I wanna make sure you don't miss this. My mother and father have five kids all by the same person. That's powerful. Yes, that's that it. is. Oh, yeah, yes. come on. You gotta oh, give yes. them credit is due. And so yes. that right there mold that that right there molded and shaped me that my father, that was about being responsible. Because right. he could have he could have did several things. He had choices, right? But he chose to stand 10 toes down and uh, as the old saying say lay in the bed that you made and so i thank him for that my life is not for me it is for of course my lord and savior but it's also paying homage to my parents because they sacrifice so much so that's good stuff i love that you know growing up um like that and i, I also know you grew up in poverty as well um and your parents i believe were they able to put you in catholic school is that am i correct with that you're correct. Wow, you read. You're well read. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's so. You know, the the educational aspect of it is so awesome. But I'm curious, when you would go to Catholic school, I'm sure these kids were a little bit more probably well to do than you, or a a good bit of them. Was it like that? Or yeah, were they it was all kind of economically. No, no, you're right. You're right about it. it. Was it was a whole? It was definitely a cross section of people. You know. Um, but you're right, you're absolutely correct about that. And once again, that that was a good thing because you said something powerful. You said we 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 lived in, you know, we were born into poverty. And that's, that's that's true, right? But I want to make sure we understand po wealth and poverty is a mindset. Yes. Wealth and poverty is not about money. That's how I was able to become a millionaire because I did we lived in poverty. I got you gotta get this. But my parents gave us an environment that poverty never lived in us. Woo, come on, somebody. That's good. 
Yes. And how do they do that? Now you ask the question, because the, the mind don't like, understand it. How can you live in poverty and go to a private school? It's called sacrifices. My parents have this infinite wisdom that if you make short times, short term sacrifices for long term results, guess what happened? And then about environment is so important. So they made sure that taking us out of our normal environment, put us into a new environment, gave us exposure and experiences. And guess what? Exposure and experiences equates to uh, it's, it's based to currency all over the world. People take experiences and they get exposure and they create opportunity. So that I just I'm telling you, they had so much wisdom. And so, yeah, we did go there and know what it was so interesting. Now, people say, well, how did they afford it? You know, that's how we got evicted 10 times because oh. my parents made a choice. Yeah. Their education first. And it was, let me tell you something, let me be honest. Now, all five of us graduated from college, with the high school, with the college. Three of the five got master degrees. Now, born a teenage parent, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. But it was all about my mother and father giving us exposure and opportunity. Now, in school, you know, once again, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a trade off. So we would go, my mother would go. Um, I'll never forget, I can go back to the first time we got evicted. We were, had a brand new house built from the ground. My father my, my father worked three jobs. My mom couldn't work because she had babies, my, 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 my sisters. And so my father worked three jobs, two jobs, not three, two jobs to provide for us. And he provided very well. We lived in the suburbs. See, we didn't live in, we lived across the track. So it was a brand new community across the track. So we moved, and then, then to be quite frank with you, back then, the area was, it was integrated. But then as gentrification started to happen, people started to move. So um so so um but we 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 lived over there we lived in a, in, in um in in not in the in the hood we lived in a, it was a, it was still chicago but they moved us across the tracks my father built a house from the ground never forget that and think about how powerful that is that being is. born into parents but those parents had the wisdom knowledge understanding the fortitude to build the house from the ground and i got to see it we would go over there every day after y'all work he would drive us by there we get to go through the house and guess what that by me seeing that guess what i've built three houses and built mcdonald's from the ground right. i'm telling you this the, the power of experience and exposure is absolutely gangster and so um because we we're going, they made that investment in private school. We did get evicted 10 times. Every year we went in college, uh, we got evicted. I never forget the first time I was a freshman and I just got there, maybe those second semester, we sitting in the cafeteria. Now I knew, I used to see my mom going to court. Matter of fact, I went to court with her. And I never forget the day the judge told my mother, you got 30 days to get out. We, we on a city bus going home and I'm sitting there, just my mind is just blown. I said, but then what are we gonna do? Let's stop and get some boxes. She said, we're not getting no boxes. I said, but did you hear what the judge said? We got to move. She said, we're not moving until God say move. Wow. Yeah. And again, that my book is called A Leap of Faith because my mother had this crazy radical faith that we couldn't see it, but it manifested into something that was absolutely uh, ridiculous. And so um, and we wound up subsequently getting evicted, but I was in my cafeteria of my Catholic high school eating lunch with my friends when my next door neighbor Jerome came in the door and said, Ken, you got to come home because everything you own is on the streets, mm. everything. And, you know, it was devastating as a child, but I never remember like being sad and it was a little bit confusion. But once again, my parents created an environment that we used it as a teachable moment. You know what she told us in that moment? You know what she said? She said, God promised us something bigger and better. Yeah. Woo, come on somebody, that's hope. That so in, a, in nice. the middle of the storm, she had the wisdom not to be like, whoa me, but to say, give uh, our children, give her children hope. And hope is being able to see past the day. If we could see past the day, it's just one day at a time. See, everybody wanna have plans and future and vision. That's good. But sometimes we get caught up into that. All you need is a hope for one day and then another day and another day, and another day. Woo, come on somebody, boy. That's why I lived on that. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow. And Listen. you know, you kind of, um, when you're talking about how you were a little bit sad, you know, but, or maybe more confused when you were evicted, <laughs> but then, yeah, and I was gonna ask you, how do, cause I think so many kids who um, go through situations like that, they battle resentment and bitterness and it kind of starts as children. They never really get over it. And it's always, you know, victimhood and, us against you know the world's against me how did you not fall into that trap 
of um, feeling resentment and, and feeling like, well, why do they get to do this? And I don't, you know, everyone gets this. And That's a great question. Well, to be, caught, we'll be totally honest, because my mother and father, I, got, I just keep, I can't make yeah. this up. They just created this environment. Guess what? We had high level conversations. They didn't try to hide stuff from yeah. us. Yeah. They didn't try to cover stuff up. They made us stretch and grow by having, it wasn't no grown folk talk, it was real life talk. And then she, you know what the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. We, those who those we were around with it, they always wrote the vision to us so we knew, we wasn't guessing. And it made it very plain. And it, it did, so every step of the way, they communicated at the highest level to us. We didn't have secrets. We had family meetings talking about things. So we were all felt like we was involved and engaged. We didn't, we didn't have a say so in it, but right. we were involved and engaged. And they kept selling us hope. It's going to be bitter. It's going to be better. And, and, and to be quite frankly, and you asked the question earlier, you said like the school we went to. Yeah, there were some people that had dual, that mother and father you know, had dual incomes and were better off than us. But guess what? Not a trip, not a luncheon, not an opportunity that we miss at all. One of those times. Now I did at, at, a, at a family um, dinner a couple of months ago, I did find out that my one sister, unfortunately, she does have a little resentment. I didn't know this because she did not get to go on one of her um. trips. But that was not my story. I yeah. went to, I went to Canada for one of my trips in eighth grade. Then high school went to Florida. So once again, my mother made sure that they used every resource they had to make sure that we had a well-rounded experience. And so it was just amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I, I can say this, yes, that it was amazing. I wouldn't trade it for the world because it, it gave it gave me perseverance. It built yes. my faith. It gave me focus. It gave me passion. And guess what I love the most about it? It gave me something that has made me so much money. Guess what it is? Creativity. See, you can do more with less. Woo, come on, somebody. <laughs> and so the fact that we didn't always have a, a, a lot, but we did more with what we had, and it was a game changer. Yeah. Just like going to Cap, know how we, we can tell you an example of that? Going, like, how do I get to a Cap for school? Because my mother got us in, but it was two of us in school at one time. Then it was three of us at the same school. Yes, three of us at the same time. So I went, my brother and I went to, I personally went to the principal and got a job sweeping floors after school so I can get a couple hundred dollars a week and I would take that money. I would put half on a tuition and put half in my pocket so I had to bother my mom for money. So I constantly did that and it was, and we made, we ended up matriculating and all that. So it was exciting. I get excited just thinking about it. that crazy. <laughs> no, I love that. And I think it's such also a testimony to the fact that, yeah, you had young parents. And I think, first of all, not that we encourage teen pregnancy, but I think sometimes people think, okay, if you have kids as, you know, if you're a teen parent, that's it. You know, your kids are going to be, going to be awful and all that. And it's like, you know, you're never too young. You're never too old. If you have the principles and if you have the wisdom, you, you can be a great parent. And I think right. there's something to be said that even if they didn't have those opportunities, it was like, okay, now we're going to make the best with what we have and what we know to do even better for our children. I, and I love that you honor your parents. Oh my goodness. Every day I have to. Yeah. Because, you know, because they sacrifice so much. I love sacrifice. I don't like yes. selfishness. There's so many parents right now who are selfish. They go through a divorce. Oh, I, so I, I need somebody to love me. Then they put people around their kids. Yeah. When it happens, I saw my, my mother and father got separated. My father divorced my mother, but he never divorced his children. Mm, that's good. That's very slowly for you. Mm -hmm. Everybody listen to me, men, women, listen to me, it's, teach, it's, teach, it's the principle. My father and mother got together at 13 and 14 procreated, but they were babies. So when they found out that they probably wasn't compatible, they had, they wind up getting divorced. But this is very important. My father never, he divorced my mother, but he never divorced his children. He would come, most of, most time, most of the experiences I've had, they were with my father come taking me out of, the, out of town, going to classical music camps, all this stuff. Once again, exposure. And I want to give homage to my mom and I want to tell women also. Now think about it. If my mom would have thought about herself and said, well, I'm still young. I got to have somebody. We brought another man in our house. 
Guess what happened? That would have fragmented the relationship with my father. But my mother left the light on and the door open for my father to be able to vacillate back and in. So, oh, man, that's just it was so powerful. And look at the fruit of that. That makes sense. Oh, and yes. so, yeah. And so it's just so profound and powerful. And I want to say something else. You said something. So and I want to encourage people. Yeah, life is going to happen to you. But what I found out and figured out is this. Write this down. Life is 10 percent what happens to you. This, you got to get this, but it's 90% how you choose to respond to it. The Bible tells us, choose this day who you'll serve every day. So we could have, so we just chose hope, faith, opportunity, instead of blame, doubt, fear. That's, that's the secret sauce right there. That's the formula. Yeah. Woo! And <laughs> the Bible is powerful. That is powerful. And it really shows that, I um, mean, we'll get into your success soon enough, like your, you know, your success as an adult. This is better than success right here. See, this is the foundation. Oh, yeah. Right here. yeah. This is the foundation. I mean, no, no respect, but this right here is the foundation of success. People want that success too quickly, but you don't have a foundation. So it's not sustainable and it crumbles. Oh, come on, somebody. Mm. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's great. I mean, even it, it, the mindset, I think some people think, okay, I just want like a workbook of what to do with my hands. But a lot of people understand this part, you know, and life is very binary, right? You either going to, like you said, choose life, or choose death, You're either going to be, you know, optimistic or a victim, you know, you can't be victim and victor at the same time. And so I, I love that um, your parents really instilled that that wisdom in you. And I love the the idea of uh, the selflessness, because I do think we live in such a society where we're very much like, you know, I got to do for me, I got to make sure I'm good, especially parents. And there's a part of, you know, I'm a mom of two, there's a part of parenting where there's, you know, sometimes you got to miss out on something. You got to, you can't do this, can't do that for the betterment of your children. So I, I love that. So when you, um, you know, graduate from high school, and I know you went to college, and um, you majored in, um, like, in the food service, something dealing with that? Okay. Well, it was a food and nutrition with a specialization in hotel and food and lodging systems. So one of the, my goal was to become a subject matter expert in the food industry. And um, SIU Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Carbondale um, had a great program. And that's a good another story. Now, think about it. Once again, we don't want to confuse people. Born and teenage parents, big at the times, went to a private school. How in the world did I get in college? I think about it. And so my mother, my mother and father told, I can never forget about 16 or 17. They got us around the table and told us, they said, when you get 18 years old, either you're going to college or you're getting out of our house. So once again, they gave us a choice and they gave, they should write the vision. So I knew I wasn't really a good student because I'm an entrepreneur. Most entrepreneurs are like C students, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, and we just hire good people around us, smarter <laughs> people around us because we got the vision. Come on, somebody, I'm just saying. And so, um, and so I wasn't really a good student because school just didn't work for me because of the regimented, it didn't make sense. The best class I've ever had, my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Alpha Crofton, who was an entrepreneur. And you know what made him so experienced? Because he went to school every day with a suit, a shirt, a tie on, and a blazer, and he talked about life. But then what he did, a massive job, was he took life and he equated it to education. And that pro and that right there was a game changer. That makes sense? And yes. so Yeah, and so um they 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 really, really put a put a put a pressure on us to go to college. And so um, I, I, my grades wasn't that good. So I went home one day and I wrote a letter to, um, I put the application in, in the school. And I also put a cover letter in there and said, my name is Kenneth Brown. Here's my transcripts. Here's my grades. It's very important. I said, but this is not a true indication of my potential. I said, all I need is an opportunity and I know I can come down there and I can uh, be a, at least an average student. I put a stamp on that letter and sent it in the mailbox. And guess what happened? In three weeks, I get a, a letter in the mail and it said, Mr. Kenneth Brown. Oh, come on, somebody. And I read the letter. It said, you have been admitted into Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. That's a life lesson. See, sometimes people, when people tell you no, no don't mean no. No means next opportunity. That's good. Too many people just stop at no and get crushed, take it personal. So what I did, instead of taking it personal, you got to let them know you personally. Come on, somebody. Yeah. So I wrote the letter. I was honest. This is not a, my true potential. See, I didn't want to put no woozy, woozy, woo. We got evicted every year. I didn't put that in there. That, that was a distraction, but 
I knew that I, I knew what was in me and all of me was an opportunity and they got me in SIU Carbondale and that was absolutely four of the probably greatest years of my life. Awesome. What made you want to major in that um, and go in that field specifically? Another great question because my father, um, we just had a meeting earlier about this, about exposure to your children. And it's so, it's so powerful. My father was a chef. He had, he had skills. He was a wonderful chef. He, he was a chef. He worked at a Hyatt Hotel and worked at University of Chicago. So every Friday he got paid. So he would, and he had Fridays off. So guess what we got to do? Get up in the morning on Friday. Mom would cook him breakfast. We would fight over with his leftovers. Then he would take me and my brother. And guess what he would do? He would put us in the car and he would take us to his job to go pick up his check. And let me tell you some what kind of experience that was to walk through those hotels and then go in the basement and go to the to go to the, go to the, the, the HR and get his check. He go show you his locker. Then you go up to the kitchen and you meet the chef and everybody that experience right there and walking into that kitchen and hearing those pots and that energy. I was I was I was clear. I knew that I wanted to work in that industry. I didn't want to be a cook, but I be in the food industry and as i got older I understand that what it is is that i'm a servant i love service so i took my love for food and got went into food service and i just thought then got a degree so i wouldn't have to work hard i could be a leader in the industry that's how i put it together yeah. and so the only reason why i became uh, uh got into the food business because i saw my father i believe this you cannot be what you cannot see and once again my father wasn't a my father was a chef but he put me in the area, the environment that I can find my passion, i.e. food service. Oh boy, that's good I stuff. Love that. I love that. <laughs> so um, after college, um, what was your next step? What would what, uh, you start working in? Oh, that's a good question. So I was, um, I joined a fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, and my oh, fraternity okay. brother taught me a lesson. They said, um, how you dress is how you would be addressed. You know, so they told me, they, so I told them I had an on-campus interview. So they coached me. I had my white jacket on, my my, I mean, my jacket, my white shirt, my red tie, and my, my slacks, well buff shoes. And I went to an on-campus interview uh, for Aramark, A-R-A, uh, Aramark Services. Um, and I had an on-campus interview. And that day, I got a job by a guy named Rick Weber. Look, now, look, he looked at my resume. And um, he said, when you matriculate, you have a job. I didn't know what matriculate meant. <laughs> I can't make this up. So when he left, I looked in the dictionary and it meant graduate. And so I graduated, I matriculated in August. <laughs> and my first assignment, I was assistant food service director of National Lewis University in Evanston, Illinois. Um, was a wonderful experience, but I subsequently wound up getting fired within six months, literally. Now think about another teachable moment. Now, here you go. Mother and father told you to go to school, get an education, get a job. Check, check, check. But then life happens. Mm. So I'm going to work every day, first one there, last one to leave. Think I'm doing a good job. And one day I came in to work and Mary sat me in my office, sat down and said, Ken, we got to let you go. Now I'm thinking I'm being promoted. She said, we got to let you go. <laughs> I think I lost my mind right then. Oh I, I cried like a baby. I was devastated because that back then I was kind of naive and I was, you know, some people, they, 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 they believed it. And that was another humbling moment for me. You know why? Because I had, I was getting my ego because I, I was, I was telling people, well, guess what? I'm the first one in my, you know, in my family to graduate and get a job in my, in my, in my major. And most of my friends and fraternity brothers had went to school for one thing, but didn't really work in it. So I started to get a little puffed up inside, not inside, but God said, break it. And literally, I mean, nothing, no write up, no nothing. Literally one day just walking in and said, you got to go. And I the only, guess what reason she gave me? She said, our styles are too different because she, because we were directors and assistant directors. So she used to come every day with her suit on and not really fighting out with the staff. I'm a servant leader. So mm -hmm. I would come in, go into the office, drop my, my briefcase, take my jacket off and go into the kitchen, roll the sleeves up and working with the people. Now I'm thinking, okay, now we got yin and yang. Yeah. But in her mind, it was like, this gentleman is, this is the physical version. It's a physical version and a spiritual version. Okay, the the physical version is that could be human. That she, I, my, the relationship I had with the staff was 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 really tight. That's what leadership is about influence. She didn't really. She was the leader, but she didn't have influence because I was the leader. I had influence. Woo! Come on, somebody. See, I believe this. A boss has the title, but a leader have the people. 
Oh my goodness, about to lose my mind up in here. I got it again for you. See, I don't like bosses because a boss only want a title, but a leader, a leader have the people. And so I didn't know that back then. I'm just doing me. So she fired me, told me my, my, our styles are too different. Now in the spiritual realm, God has something bigger and better in store for me. Because if I would have stayed there, I would have went up through the ranks and be, but he had something bigger and better in store for me. So he had to course correct. Come on somebody. And so I can't make this up. And so, um, I was devastated though. I never forget going into my office, got my suit on, cleaning the board of health, and left out of there with all my belongings in the doggone French fry box. Mm. You talk about ego, you talk about a gut check, you talk about humbling. And I went home, I cried, and I locked myself into my, my apartment for maybe uh, at least a month, literally, just trying to figure it out. Once again, I was not sad, I was confused. What did I do? I did the right stuff. See, but I figured, is that people try to do the right thing so much it's life happens once again life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you choose to respond to it i didn't do nothing wrong it was life happens yes and what we're learning is that you don't have to happen with it most of us happen with life if life parks them they park if life crushed them they crushed that makes sense and so what i figured out and found out is that no you gotta work around it you gotta work around it so yeah but um Got fired. That was one of the best. Once again, sound crazy. That was one of the best things ever happened to me. <laughs> wow, wow! I love that you said uh, that you were confused, like how that this happened. When you were saying that, remind me of and the story in the Bible with the man who was blind, and you know, people are wondering what did he do? Did his parents do something? You know, and I do think we have this this idea that okay, if something bad happens. You must have done something. And so I think that's what keeps us trapped, where you have to just look at, like you said, life happens. Sometimes life. things just happen. We don't know why God allows certain things to happen. We don't know. Um, but in but that particular thing, he being fired into I, being the best thing. And I, and I love that idea because I think so much, so many of us have this like, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And God's trying to take you way beyond that trying to take you behind beyond your list so i just think that would encourage so many of our viewers who've had maybe a door closed or an opportunity didn't happen that hey god god probably wanted that to happen for a reason and if you would have stayed there then and if you would have stayed there you wouldn't have i'm sure gone on to no i know i know i wouldn't have i know so can i interject something yes please do just i want to put that out there you know is that you know the bible tells us this it says Many other plans are the man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. I say that again, it feels good even saying that, don't it? You know, many other plans are the man's heart, but it's, the, but it's the Lord's purpose, the Lord's purpose, the Lord's purpose that will prevail. And so what that means is, and it's kind of hard living, you know, living in a world because the world tells you, what's your plan? No one thing I hate right now, gotta be honest with you, when somebody asks me, what's your plans? Yeah. I can't stand yeah. that. You do that. I do me. I live day by day. When you when you open like that and you flexible, but people and so that bothered me so much now. What are you doing? I don't know. But guess what? Whatever whatever it comes up, I'm ready for it. Woo, come on, somebody. Yes. Yes. And not that and that ain't living willy nilly. That's yeah. just living on a whole other level. Does right. that make sense? Oh yes. So, yeah, many other plans are the man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose will prevail. And when we was, we have to be able to yield our plans to God's plans. And most of us don't want to do that. We just want what we want. That makes mm -hmm. sense? Oh, yes. That's yes. Stuff. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Mr. Ken Brown. Isn't he amazing? Well, Stay tuned for part two because we're going to immediately jump in to when Mr. Brown owned his first McDonald's franchise and the divine connection that made that happen. You guys will not want to miss it. It's, it's just it's amazing.